Hi and welcome to another narration presented by yours truly, Cryptids Roost. Let's just take a moment silence for all the haters, Karens and the trolls. That's enough. Be sure to check out the blooper reel at the end of the video which is then followed by the end screen where you will find more videos listed. So grab your coffee, sit back and enjoy the show. And don't forget, where fear is, happiness is not. I grew up in a village, stranded in the middle of the desert, where I was told that the rest of the world had died. I should never have left it. This awesome story is written by Sir Flat Footed. Daddies, mommies, brothers, sisters, it is a new era and a new age. Every new age brings something new. There's a new site that gives you all your quality jackets, joggers, shoes, bags, hoodies and lots more. Matenzi.com Check them out today and I bet you won't regret patronising with them. And you will definitely demand more. It's Matenzi today, Matenzi tomorrow and Matenzi forever. 100% perfection. Remember to use the code XYZ for a 10% discount. The world outside is gone. Only the village lives on. For most of my childhood, this was my truth. Me and my mom lived in a tiny community comprised of a few dozen people. Our village laid in the middle of the desert, an agglomeration of flimsy houses worn down by a lack of care and the frequent sandstorms. There were no roads here, no technology that would have linked use to the remains of the dead world. Life was difficult and it took a toll on all of us. I saw our fellow villagers daily, but can't recall what their smiles were like. Still, at least we were alive. The last people alive on earth, as our leader constantly reminded us and we were lucky enough to have a working well in the centre of the village. The water of which we used to grow the few crops we had to feed us. I spent most of my days reading. There was no electricity here, but my mother was an avid reader and had brought a lot of books from the world before. I learned about how the old world worked, about self-moving machines made out of metal called cars about televisions and computers. I remember her also fervently insisting on using them to teach me. She wanted me to know how to read, how to write, some history, some maths. She used to be passionate about me getting an education. She did not want me to turn feral, she said. But little by little, the passion within her died and my lessons became even rarer. I was 13 now, and the thought that I had still been too young to comprehend that world while I still lived in it saddened me. I had often harassed my mom with questions. Why can't we leave the village? When did we move here? What happened to the outside world? Every time I could see how disturbed they made her. She only ever gave me very brief answers. The world outside was uninhabitable now. Everything that was good in it had died, and the only people left alive were bloodthirsty monsters. She had taken me here where it was safe when I was still young. My dad had died in the old world, and I must promise not to ever, ever try to leave the village. This was the same story told by our leader. A grim looking man with a black bushy beard, he had never been a brute to me, but part of me deeply feared him. He did not like me reading. Every time he saw me with a book, he would peer at me with those crazy bulging eyes. He had told my mom to take those books away from me many times, that it would make me too curious. She had tried. She had hidden those books in every nook and cranny of the village but I always managed to find them. 
As such, our leader had suggested she just burn them. Thankfully, she could never bring herself to do it. I had always admired her for that, because generally, the world of our leader was law, and crossing him was not a common occurrence. One day, I heard roaring thunder on the horizon. A point in the distance grew bigger and bigger, the sound becoming ever louder as it did. I was terrified at first, but as it approached, I noticed it matched the description of what I had read in many of my books. It was a car. The villagers had come out of their houses, looking at it in fear. Eventually it stopped, and the doors opened. Two people came out, a man and a woman. They did not look like monsters, and they did not look dangerous. They just seemed very puzzled. I had my fears, of course, but the desire to see a car and to talk to the only new, friendly faces that came from the world outside overtook me as I ran towards them. Benjamin! Stop! My mum screamed, but it was too late. I was determined to learn more about these people. As I came in closer, I saw that they were just humans, like us, but their clothes looked colourful and clean. Nothing like the rags we all wore here. They were well groomed and had a pleasant smell. What are you doing here, little guy? The woman asked. This is my village. I live here with my mom. The two briefly looked at each other before the man turned his attention back to me. A puzzled look on his face. You live here? Why? Their questions confused me. Well, because it's safe here and the rest of the world is dead. Dead? No, it's n I heard a huge explosion and looked back to see our leader holding a small metal rod I would later recognise as a gun. I turned my attention back to the two strangers. One of them was screaming on the ground, bleeding profusely from his leg. The other one had put her hands up in fear. Get them! The leader shouted. Most of the villagers were in too much of a shock to obey, but the four strongest of them ran towards us and took the couple away. My mom looked terrified, so much that she seemed to have forgotten about me for a few minutes. Eventually she grabbed me by the arm and dragged me back home. She did not sleep much that night. I don't think anyone could, not with the screams that were frequently erupting from our leader's house. As the screams periodically quietened down, I could hear her pacing back and forth, but couldn't tell what she was doing. Not until I saw a bright light out of my window and observed, powerless as all our books were consumed by the flames. Life had become even duller. I had no more books to read, and there were no kids around my age to play with. The only novelty was the presence of the two strangers that had come here in their car. They had disappeared for a while, locked in the basement of our leader's house, but had finally been allowed to join us. Unfortunately, they had become dull too. Every time I tried to ask them the many questions regarding the outside world I had learnt about, they would just parrot what I had already heard a thousand times. The old world was dead. This village was the only place that remained. The two of them had lived alone in their car for years. They had to sell clothes for a living, so they had a reserve of clean ones to wear. They had travelled around the country, but every place they stopped by was full of monsters. They were only locked in our leader's basement because he wanted to make sure they weren't monsters too. And they did not know what I meant when I mentioned screaming that night. They hadn't heard anything. Their story seemed off to me, but I eventually ended up resigning myself to accepting it. My mum did not like me talking to our new neighbours. 
She always looked at them with a mixture of fear and distrust. To me, they both seemed like decent people. In fact, I found them quite subservient, and that was despite the fact that our leader had ordered their car burnt down. Even I was upset about that, as this would have been my only chance to see one of those cars in other form than simply in text. I imagined they must have been furious, but they seemed resigned. My theory was that they were just happy to have found a safe community like ours in such a hostile world. I would quickly realise how wrong I was. A few months had passed without anything out of the ordinary happening. I had gotten used to our new neighbours and a few people had started opening up to them. My mum was not one of those people. She still deeply distrusted them, as did our leader. One night I was awoken by shouting. I couldn't make out what was happening, so I quickly got dressed and stormed outside. My mum tried to stop me as I ran past her, but it was in vain. I told you this would happen. We cannot trust anyone from outside the village. Our leader was walking back and forth between our two new neighbours that were kneeled down in front of him, periodically pointing his gun at them. Please, we're sorry, we won't tell anyone, the man said. Samuel, is this really necessary? Nervously asked one of the villagers. Our leader shot a furious gaze at him. You all told me I should give them a chance. Do you people not understand what is at stake here? Come on, let's just lock them back up and... And what? We just leave them there and patiently wait for them to attempt to escape again while we have to feed them the little food we have. Food that they won't help produce. Maybe they'll come around. Even if they manage to escape, they would be stranded in the middle of the desert. Our leader shook his head. I won't take any chances. Do you realise what they would do if they found us? I made a promise I would keep you all safe and I meant it. Even if this is what it takes. What happened next is a blur. I remember a red mist of blood coming out of the man's mouth. The woman screamed. <coughs> But soon, a second shot came out of the leader's gun, and she too hit the floor. My mum, who had spent all this time half-heartedly attempting to pull me back, suddenly used all of her strength to drag me back home. I was in a state of shock. As I looked up to my mother for comfort, I saw something I would never forgive. She did not look angry. She did not look scared. She simply looked relieved. I wouldn't be able to say exactly when I knew I had to leave the village. Part of me had always wanted to explore the unknown, but it used to be more of a pipe dream than any sort of concrete plan. Ever since our leader had murdered the two strangers though, I had gotten more and more convinced I needed to leave this place. Every night I would look out of my window and picture how I would escape, in which direction I would run, how much food and water I would take, if I would tell my mother anything, until one night leaving just felt right. I collected my blankets and sneaked out of my room. After that I got a hold of the bag my mum used when she helped collecting crops. I grabbed all of the food I could and then headed for the well. There I filled our two jugs full of water and headed for the desert. The night was chilly even with all the blankets I had wrapped myself in. I felt guilty about leaving my mum before at least talking to her, but she would never have let me leave had I given her a warning. I told myself that one day I would find a good place with good people and that I would come back for her. I walked for days under a blazing sun and through freezing nights. 
directing myself with the help of the distant mountains. At multiple points I felt like I would never make it. Part of me wanted to head back to the village, but every time that thought crossed my mind, I reminded myself of the demise of the two strangers who had attempted to escape. Would the leader kill me too? If I was to die, I at least wanted to see what was really out there before I did. Beyond exhausted, I finally reached a road. I had read about how they were used in the old world and feared that following it may have led me to the monsters, but doing so was my only alternative to simply dying in the desert. Cars passed by. I tried to hide from them at first, fearful of who might be driving them, but hiding in such a flat terrain was next to impossible, and the ones that did see me did not seem to care. Eventually, I stopped minding them. Four of five cars had passed me by before one of them stopped. An old man came out looking distraught. Young man? I froze. Why are you alone? Where are your parents? I did not know how to respond to that. The village had always sought to conceal its presence. Revealing its existence may have put my mother in danger. Still, unable to form any kind of sentence, I simply shrugged. Honey? An old woman came out of the car and started talking to the old man. Honey, he's clearly distressed. Let's bring him back to the city. The old man nodded. Well, come on, young man. You can't stay alone in the middle of the desert. I hesitated. I remembered all of the horror stories regarding the outside world I was told back in the village. But these people did not seem like monsters, and the last strangers I had met had never attempted to harm me in any way. The old woman extended her hand, and I took it. Being inside a car would have been an extremely exciting novelty for me, had I not been so nervous. The old couple kept asking me questions I did not know how to answer. Which city do you come from? Well, what music do you like? What's your favourite radio station? Or if you want, we could use the Spotify's. I could tell that my lack of answers deeply concerned them. Honey, we should really bring him to a hospital. After a while, we reached a huge city, or at least that's what it seemed like to me, whose only experience of community was a tiny village. At first I curled up below the car window, trying to hide from what might see me from the outside. But little by little I rose up and dared to look at the streets. It was a marvellous sight, plenty of people wearing clean clothes, holding bags full of food, huge buildings as far as the eye could see, and more cars in a few seconds than I had known people in my entire life. We reached the hospital. The old couple did not leave my sight as the doctors inspected me. He's malnourished and dehydrated. Other than that, he seems to be in good health. But he won't tell us anything. We don't know where he comes from, nor where his parents are. Are you sure his head is all right? The old woman asked with a shaky voice. He does not seem to have suffered any trauma. Still, we need to establish the identity of his parents. I think the police would be best suited for that. The old couple gave their thanks, then brought me to a police station nearby. A couple of men in blue questioned the old couple, leaving me in the waiting room. A bunch of magazines were laid on the table, and I grabbed one as quickly as I could. This had been my first time reading after my mom had burnt all of our books a couple of months ago. After a few dozen minutes, the old couple and the police officers came back out of the office. 
A slightly overweight, moustached man, who seemed to be the leader of the group, reassured the both of them. You did the right thing, bringing him to us. Do not worry, we will take care of him now. What will happen to him? The old man asked timidly. First, we'll try to locate his parents. If we do, we'll launch an investigation to check why he ran away from home. In the worst case, we may have to place him in a foster home or an orphanage. Please, keep us updated. And if the little man needs a new home, I think our son won't mind us hosting him in his old room. He's grown now, you know. The old woman smiled, a twinkle in her eye. The moustached officer nodded. After giving me a tap on the head and telling me that everything would be all right, the couple headed for the door. The moustached man brought me in his office, along with one of his red-haired colleagues. First, he asked me if I wanted anything to drink or to eat. I told him that the old couple had already given me a few snacks on the way here, but that I would gladly drink something. He obliged, and then the questions began. What is your name? Benjamin. Nice to meet you, Benjamin. I'm Paul. Could you tell me why you were on your own when that couple found you? I hesitated. My mother had always told me to fear the outside world and not to trust anyone who wasn't from the village. But so far, everyone I had met outside of the village had been just as good to me or better than anyone I had known while living there. Maybe it was all right for me to open up a bit. I ran away from my village. Your village? What is it called? I shrugged. It doesn't really have a name. We simply referred to it as home. The two officers quickly glanced at each other. The red-haired man, who did not seem very interested by my case up to this point, started staring at me intensely from that point on. The moustached man cleared his throat <coughs> and proceeded. And you lived there with your parents? With my mom. My dad passed away when I was still very young. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's all right. I never really knew him. Could you tell us more about your village? Where is it located, for instance? It's... it's somewhere in the desert. I can't really say where. The couple that found you said you were walking alongside a road. Does that road pass through your village? There are no roads where I come from. The red-haired man seemed more and more puzzled by what I was saying. The moustached man turned towards him. He seemed to hesitate for a bit, then asked me to excuse them as they had a word outside the room. Cautious, I put my ear against the door to hear what they were saying. Do you hear what I'm hearing, Joe? I do, but I'm not sure what to make of it can't say I'm an expert with interrogating children, but this sounds even more serious than I thought. Maybe we should call on a child psychologist before we proceed further. At this hour, I don't think we'll have much luck. Perhaps we should keep the kid here tonight and wait until next morning then. He doesn't have anywhere to go anyway. The discussion continued for a little while. There were terms thrown around which I did not fully understand. From what I could tell, the moustached man was wondering whether keeping a child in a police station for an entire night was all right, while the red-haired man reassured him that it was. Eventually, they both came back in the office and told me I would spend the night here, offering me books and blankets to make my stay more comfortable. I suppose most people would have called my sleeping quarters frugal, but to me, those were the cleaner sheets I could remember ever sleeping in. Wake up! I opened my eyes and saw the red-haired officer in front of me. What time is it? It's early, but this is important. 
We found someone that can help you. Come with me. I got up and quickly got dressed in the new clothes the moustached man had brought me before I had fallen asleep the night before. I then proceeded to follow the officer. Can I say goodbye to your friend before leaving? Paul? No, he isn't there right now. I'm sorry. That's a shame. He was nice. Yes. Don't worry, he told me he would understand if you had no time to say your goodbyes. When we got out of the police station, I followed the officer for a few more minutes. Our path ended in front of a car, where a dark-haired man, who must have been in his thirties, was waiting for me. Here, this is the kid I told you about. Do you think it could be him? The man looked at me. I could feel his eyes cutting through me like razor blades. He stared at my face for some time, then took out a photograph. His gaze wandered back and forth between the photograph and my face for at least a full minute. It very well could be. Hard to say. Well, you gonna take him or not? We can't stay here too long. The black-haired man turned his attention back to me. Hi, Benjamin, right? I nodded. My name's Geo. I'll be taking care of you from now on, if that's all right. I wondered how much of a choice I really had. Then again, everyone I had met so far had been nice to me, and this man did not seem much different from the rest. Yes. I think it should be fine, I answered, as he opened the door of his car and gave me a sign to climb in. After driving for a few hours, we arrived. Gio's house was even bigger and prettier than the rest of them. When I first arrived, he took a few pictures of me, asked me a few questions about my mom, and then disappeared for a few hours. When he came back, he told me I would live here from now on, a huge smile on his face. For the next few months, he did not ask much of me. Many people came in and out of the house to have long discussions with him. He told me that they came for advice and that giving it was his job. He told me that maybe one day he would tell me how to do it. Gio brought me to a hairdresser. He also bought me a new pair of sunglasses, which he said I should wear often, as it would protect my eyes which had been damaged by my time in the desert. He would often take me out to restaurants where I discovered flavours that were completely alien to me, he showed me around the city, bought me ice cream, taught me how to use a computer and gave me plenty of books, movies and video games. I would say I was living the dream, but I deeply missed my mom and really wanted to see her again. Shortly after my 14th birthday, Gio started asking me questions in a very relaxed, nonchalant way. Could you tell me a bit more about the village you come from? Who lived there besides you and your mom? I told him about the rest of them. The woman with a crooked nose, the man with no hair, the couple that would never leave each other's side, and of course our leader. That one in particular really caught his attention. As he kept asking questions about him, finally he let out a laugh. <laughs> Fucking Samuel. You know him? I asked, surprised he knew his name. I know all of them and especially him. But how? Let me ask you this instead. What did they tell you about your father? My dad, well, he passed away when I was young. Gio grinned. No, Ben, your dad is very much alive. I'd stay silent for a little while trying to take all of this in. Gio was patiently sitting in the chair across from my own, waiting for me to say something. But 
My mother has always said, She lied, Ben. She did not want you to know about him. Why? Where is he? He's in prison. Prison? Isn't that where they lock up criminals? Yes, but don't worry, Ben. Your dad is not a criminal. They simply lied about him. Can I go visit him? No, I'm afraid the lies they told about him were so severe that they won't allow anyone to visit him for now. My heart was racing. I then proceeded to ask a question I did not want to hear the answer to. Who is they? Who betrayed him? The people in your village. All of them. Except for you, of course. You were too young. Images of my village were racing through my mind. Life had been hard there, sure. The people seemed miserable. But none of them were evil. That being said, our leader did kill that innocent couple. If he was capable of doing that, there was no telling what else he might have done before settling in the village. Why? Your father was a very beloved man. He had many friends in many places, even some of the most important ones. Samuel too, your leader as you call him, was once a friend of your dad's. In fact, he was one of his best ones. They used to work together quite a lot. What was their job? Geo seemed to hesitate for a bit, then answered, Protection. Your dad made sure that shop owners all across the country were well protected from thieves and hooligans. A sense of pride rushed through my head. Not only was I a child of someone important, I was also the child of a good person who cared for the security of others. But then, why did they betray him? That, Ben, I do not know. Samuel were the brains behind it all. We think that maybe he got caught doing something bad and was offered freedom in exchange for betraying your dad. I could feel a hint of anger in Geo's voice which had remained unwaveringly calm up to this point. Or maybe he just decided he no longer wanted to work with him. Who knows? He found other people that were just as jealous of your dad as he was. Some of his clients, mostly. In exchange, he promised that he would keep them safe, no matter the personal cost. They all told horrible lies about your father, about how he did not really protect people, about how he bullied them into paying for his protection. It was all nonsense, of course. My mum wouldn't do that. I almost wanted to apologise for raising my voice like that to someone who had been so kind to me. But Geo did not seem bothered by it. As I said, I do not know why each individual person in your village personally decided to betray your father. There were parts of your father's work your mother knew little about. Nothing bad, of course, but maybe she was lied to or tricked into believing that it was. Geo picked up his glass and drank some water from it, then continued. They did not go to the village straight away, you know. Samuel promised them that he would find a safe place for them to live after the fact. They tried to start new lives all over the country. They even thought about settling outside of it. But like I told you, your father had many friends not just in this country, but in the entire world. We would always close in on them, and Samuel knew it. Eventually, though, all of them disappeared. Nobody knew where they had gone. That is, until we met you, Ben. We are going to need your help. To know where the village is? Exactly. We want to bring justice to the people who wronged your father. Justice? What will you do to them? Geo laughed. 
Oh, nothing too bad. Don't worry. We just want to find out why they lied about your father like so. Maybe even convince them to help us to get him out of prison. Who knows? Then you could finally meet him. I... I don't know. I understand, Ben. Please, take all the time you need. After the initial shock of all those revelations had passed, I quickly made up my mind. I wanted to see my mom again, to be reunited with her in this world of light and abundance. Gio was a good man. He would see that my mother was no traitor. Maybe my father would even be released once all the horrible lies the villagers had told about him were proven false. Maybe we could all be reunited. I did not precisely know where my village was, of course, but Gio showed me where the old couple had reported picking me up and the pieces of the puzzles started to fit. I remembered the mountains in the distance, the defunct buildings I had occasionally come across. After a few days I finally managed to locate my village precisely. It was hard to tell from the satellite imagery that a village was there as the frequent sandstorms had covered the roofs and walls in grainy dust. But it definitely was. I was sure of it. Great job, Ben. You did us a great favour today, Gio said, before making multiple calls. That night, after coming back home from ice cream, many people were waiting in Gio's parking lot. Gio approached and greeted them, tapping some of them on the back. He then told me to go upstairs. Are you going to find my mom? I asked. Yes, Ben. The day is finally come. Before I turned heel to enter the house, I saw a man carrying multiple metallic objects and putting them in the trunk of Gio's car. I thought I had recognised their shape, but refused to believe it. I ran towards the trunk. My heart dropped as I realised that those were indeed guns, but the trunk was also filled with so much more. Ropes, chains, gasoline, jugs covered in stickers warning of the hazardousness of their content. Gio, who had made little effort to stop me from running off, casually approached and slammed the trunk. I thought you were just going to talk. What the hell do you need all of this for? I told you, the village is unarmed, save for the one small gun Samuel wields. Gio smiled. Don't worry, Ben. It's just like your father's job. Unfazed, he finished. For protection. I hope you all enjoy the blooper reel. Worn down by lack. There was no electricity here. But my mother was an avid reader and had brought a lot of the books. She wanted me to learn. He had told my mom to take those. Not until I saw a bright light out of my windows and observed powerless as all our books were consumed. <coughs> I remember a red mist of blood. If I was to die, I at least wanted to see what was... and feared that following it may lead to me... fuck's sake. Cautious, I put my ear against the... I almost wanted to apologise for raising my... I'll start again. It was hard to tell from the satellite imagery there was a village was Hey family, please be so kind as to throw punch the like button and smack the ass of the subscription button as well. And remember to choke hold that notification bell and then select all. That way you'll receive all notifications each time I upload a new video. 
and by subscribing you'll be the first to see all of our new spooky creepypasta stories. A very big thank you to Sir Flatfooted for allowing me to narrate this awesome story. Make sure to check out Sir Flatfooted's Reddit page for more brilliant stories as well. Also be sure to check out the Sir Flatfooted playlist here for more of the stories that I may have already narrated. I would just like to say a very big thank you to all of the authors that I have worked with and all the ones that I will work with in the future. So thank you all, my brothers and sisters. And why not? Hashtag cryptids roost in your comments. If you would like to support the channel and help make us grow, I have an account at buymeacoffee.com. You can buy me a coffee with your donations, big or small, to that site. You can also support us at Ko-Fi, which is an alternative to Patreon. I have an account at BitChute, which is an alternative to YouTube. I've also created a brand new Instagram account, so be sure to check that out. Or you could support us and donate via paypal.me slash cryptidsroost. All relevant links will be below. And don't forget to check out the end screen, see above. That will also list some more videos in my back catalogue. Take care everyone, and I hope you all have a wonderful and peaceful night. And don't forget, where fear is, happiness is not.